जिमी 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 डिड यू स्टार्ट हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम टू प्रैक्टिकली वी ब्रिंग लर्निंग अ लाइफ एंड टुडे आई एम हियर टू डिस्कस विथ यू ऑल द सैम्पल पेपर फॉर क्लास ट्वेल्व टर्म टू अकॉर्डिंग टू द एग्जाम पैटर्न फॉर टर्म टू विच इज सब्जेक्ट यू and along with some important questions we are also going to discuss a solution how to write the answers since the pattern this time is subjective it means you'll have to write each and every point and also justify your answer so that is what we are going to discuss today so let's begin so this is the latest pattern according to cbsc the question paper will be of 35 marks and we'll have a uh, total 13 questions in it so in which uh it has three sections section a will have six question of two marks each that is short answer type questions section b will also have six question but of three marks each which is a long answer type question and then we have section c which will have one question of five marks which can be a case study or a long answer question and uh there is no uh, as such options but there are internal choices like in some questions you might get the option of like you know or that you can attempt another question so there are internal choices and we have to select one out of that and obviously we need to draw proper diagrams or uh, flow charts wherever required okay so based on this pattern let's see the sample paper one and here is a first question from section a which is of 2 marks how is the normal body human body temperature of 37 degrees celsius maintained during summers and winter okay so whoever are watching i want you all to try to answer this question try to frame the answer since it is not an mcq type question we'll have to uh, write the answer and also justify it so you can think and if you feel and uh, if you get any important points you can uh, write in the chat box or you can comment and then we'll discuss okay so uh, let's discuss the answer but before that we know that you know uh, human body maintains homeostasis that is proper balance of various things whether it is uh, different fluids electrolytes temperature so this is the special property homeostasis so based on that yeah so in summers uh, obviously the outside temperature is mo sometimes more than 37 degree celsius it is a normal human body temperature so therefore sweating is one of the body mechanism to maintain the proper heat inside our body and if there is a basic science rather physics behind it like we know that if there is a surface and if there are water droplets on the surface what happens when there is heat water being a better conduct uh, uh, conductive uh, substance for heat it will quickly absorb all the heat and then it will get vaporized and thus leaving the surface cooler since the water will uh, also absorb the heat from the surface it will not let this outer heat you know heat up the surface and the water will evaporate and this evaporation will cause cooling it's 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 a basic principle which you can observe anything like suppose if you uh, uh, wrap your hand or your head with a uh, wet cloth then uh, you can see you you will naturally uh, feel the coolness that is because of the evaporation and that is what the purpose of sweating of body is when the temperature is high body sweats uh, obviously we know the biology behind it that we have special sweat glands and pores in our skin which will release a set uh, sweat which is 99% of water along with some salts and excretory substances and that will help to maintain the proper body temperature so this is a mechanism which our body uh follows in the summer so in this the the key word to be written in the answer is uh, the sweating mechanism that the body sweats profusely and which results in the evaporative cooling so these are the two important keywords over here since this is a two mark question and there are two parts in it so for writing the uh, mechanism for summer it will have one mark okay and then in winter 
in winter what mechanism is followed well we know that in winter the outer temperature is lower than the body temperature and therefore we shiver so this is a mechanism and it's very interesting to know like we all have noticed that we when we go out in winter or when the temperature drops our body naturally starts shivering if you are not wearing anything warm okay so our body shivers so if you have observed carefully when we shiver our body shakes right it's a very uh, it's not that uh, wide shaking but there is some amount of shaking in like literally every part and because of that slight shaking that the the physical movement uh, causes to uh, the heat of the body to rise it's the basic principle for example if we run if we run fast or if we dance or if we jump naturally our body temperature rises because the metabolic process in our body rises so this is a by default mechanism by our body that it will start shiver and that movement will cause the rise in the temperature okay so we shiver and which is a kind of exercise which produces heat and hence it raises the body temperature so in this answer the key word is that we shiver and that will produce the heat okay so this is a mechanism how our body maintains 37 degree celsius in winter and this was also of one mark yeah thank you pranati so uh, this was question one on how is normal body temperature maintained and this was the answer let's move ahead if you have any query you can type in the chat box or you can uh, also leave uh, the comment in the comment section and we'll surely get back to help you next question differentiate between opioids and cannabinoids on the basis of their a specific receptor site in human body and b mode of action in human body okay so we know that basically opioids are can and cannabinoids are the type of drugs and they have a particular effect so every drug has a target in our body so that every drug targets in our body and then it le leads to some uh, effect and that is what been asked in this question it's a direct question and let's see how to answer this so you can write it in a uh, table format or you can simply write down uh, in the the basic lines so first since A, they have asked what is the specific receptor site in the human body. So we know the basic mechanism is generally if you take any cell, okay, it will have certain receptors on it, okay. And whatever foreign substance uh, which comes in our body, it has to bind with the receptor to show the effect in that cell or that particular part. And this is the basic mechanism of our immune system also. So when, when a certain drug, suppose opioid, when it enters our body, the receptor are located in the GI tract. I hope all of you know what is GI tract. It is the gastrointestinal tract. So the gastrointestinal tract is nothing but a digestive system mainly the esophagus and the intestine following with it. So that is the receptor along with the central nervous system. So central nervous system includes the brain, the spinal cord and the nerves associated with it. So for opioids in our body, these two are the receptors. And for cannabinoids, the receptor is located in brain only. Okay, that is for cannabinoids. So this answers the A part of the question, that is specific receptor in our body. Now, B is mode of action. How do opioids actually act? So opioids, they act as depressant. So depressant, of course, it's not something related to depression, but it is somewhere close to it that uh, when we use depressant, it uh, slows down the process of our body. That's what is written. It slows down the body function. It decreases the metabolic uh, speed or, or rate which the th different things takes place in our body. And that is what the effect of opioids is. That's why these drugs are also used in certain medicines in psychiatry. If a person is suffering uh, from hyperactivity or some worry, uh, these are used as depressant to cool them down and whereas cannabinoids it affects the cardiovascular system of the body it can alter the heart rate and obviously these drugs are have to be taken under medical prescription then only it will show the proper uh, therapeutic effect if it they are taken in excess it can surely harm the particular part which they are acting upon so in this way these drugs will uh, have uh, a specific receptor to receive them and this will be the action shown by both of them okay so again this is a two mark question so for each uh, part that is specific receptor for opioid it will be half mark this will yield you half mark the effect of opioid will yield you half mark and cannabinoids half mark 
okay it's a easy question from the human health and disease i hope all of you have understood yeah thank you deepak so now let's move on to the next question so this is or so as we discussed before there are internal options in the uh, questions as well so question 2 had an option between the previous question or this one so since we are discussing the sample paper i will be discussing the answers for or questions also so the question in option was principle of vaccination is based on the property of memory of the immune system taking one suitable example justify the statement so again, this uh, question is also from human health and disease. Generally, the internal options are given uh, from the same chapter, the same topic. Okay. So now this question is upon based upon vaccination. I am sure most of us have undergone a vaccination for COVID. So let's understand the principle. I if you are if I have studied basic biology, all of you will know. But now let's let's see how to write the answer in the exam to get you know uh, the full marks. Okay. So. So obviously the principle of vaccination and immunization is based on property of memory of the immune system and let's take example of polio vaccine over here okay you can also give example of covid vaccine i'll explain it at the end of this for this answer we are taking example of polio vaccine and again polio uh, vaccine is one of the most widely taken vaccine in india like literally like you no know, every uh, child every house they have been you know there was mass vaccination uh, process by government through which the polio vaccine was given and the polio is almost eliminated from India thanks to the mass vaccination. So let's take the example of polio vaccination. So what happens in vaccination is the vaccine which is there it has certain antigenic proteins in it. Now uh, if we have any pathogen now we know pathogen is a disease causing microbe or microbial. Suppose this is a pathogen it will have some genetic material in it and it will have some surface proteins okay they they may not be like this always but this is just an example so it will have uh, certain surface proteins and these surface proteins have the antigenic property so these are basically the antigen antigen means which will which can enter our body and stimulate our immune system okay so uh, they have the antigenic properties like certain things present on the pathogen that is polio virus so in the vaccines have the inactivated or weakened pathogen so now again vaccines are of different types as we have studied in human health and disease there are certain vaccines which are made out of dead pathogens and there are certain vaccines which are made from weakened pathogens and there are certain vaccines which are made only taking the protein covid vaccine is one of the example recombinant vaccines which we call so the polio vaccine is either inactivated or weakened pathogen so that is introduced in the body and the antibodies okay again important word antibodies produced in the body against this antigen would neutralize the pathogenic agents which cause the infection so since the antibodies will neutralize the infection won't happen okay that is what the purpose of vaccination is so that is why it it is also called as you know we say prevention is better than cure so if we have already taken vaccine our body will be already ready with the antibodies because our body will already already have the antigen for that particular disease and once that antigen is there our body will quickly start making antibodies against it and our body will be prepared for it okay so this antigen is remembered by our uh, the cells of our immune system that's why the concept of memory comes into picture okay so this is what the answer about and then uh, so the main another important part in this answer that polio vaccines generate memory B and T cell. We know there are two sites of lymphocytes. So basically B and T cells are lymphocytes which come under the white blood cells also a very important part of immune system. B lymphocyte and T lymphocyte they uh, generally remember the antigen and then hence it will recognize the pathogen quickly on subsequent exposure okay and then it invades with a massive production of antibodies so basically b lymphocytes t lymphocytes uh, help the b lymphocytes to get activated and b lymphocytes are the one which will cause stimulate the production of antibodies so this is how the entire uh, process will work so here the answer is give uh, explain in elaborate way again we need to remember some important keywords so first you need to give some example so we have taken example of polio vaccine it can be any other vaccine 
okay and then we have to explain the properties that it has antigens on it which is inactivated or weakened pathogen and it will produce antibodies okay so explaining each point will get one mark and this point is important that the polio vaccine they will generate the memory b and t cells which will recognize the pathogen in future okay so if you write these points you will easily get two marks okay uh, so deepak uh, if the board is blood you can uh, you know just try to go to the you to the video you can see three dots in the corner of the video just click on it and then choose the video quality so sometimes by default it takes 144p as the default video quality try to choose the option of a uh, high picture quality if you choose that option you'll be able to see more uh, clean board okay so just try this option anyone else also who is facing the video problem just try to increase the video quality level in your settings of the video okay still if you're not able to see then let us know please do check the net network okay let's move ahead next question how did a citizen group called friends of Arietta marsh arcata california usa help to improve water quality of marshland using integrated wastewater treatment explaining four steps okay so this is a, a question from the environment section and uh, this is basically a question from the case study which is given in already given in ncrt so if you have studied the case study you will be easily able to answer this so let's see the answer so arcata this particular place in california use a special sewage water treatment system okay and the water cleaning process is divided into two stages so one is traditional so let's see the traditional uh, what it is so what happens first the solid waste in the water are sedimented okay so we all know what is sedimentation it settles down all the dirt the heavy particles are settled down and it is referred as primary care following that the water is filtered and disinfectant is added and generally chlorine is used as disinfectant this is an additional point if you wish you can mention but what is important to mention here is the solid waste are sedimented okay and then the disinfectant is added okay so this point will carry one mark the traditional approach and then the next step is inventive step in which the dangerous contaminants such as heavy metals are removed using this cutting edge step step what is that the water is carried through six series of marshes okay since it is a marshland so there are six series of marshes constituted over 60 acres of marshland again this is an additional detailed information you can uh, go for it if you remember but then we need to remember the keywords even if you don't have any detailed information the key the presence of keywords is important over here so uh, where appropriate fungi algae and plants are developed after sedimentation so again this is an important point over here that on that marshland where this things are sedimented there are special fungi algae and plants which are developed and these fungi algae plants are responsible for neutralizing and assimilation of toxins in the water so basically they are using natural resources they are using biological components like fungi algae and plants to neutralize the assimilation of toxins okay so mentioning this each will you will you half mark each so in this way you can answer this question and get full two marks okay so if you have understood then uh, give, a, give a thumbs up or at least uh, write in the comment section if you find any question as difficult if you need further explanation uh, please do let us know and we are there to help you out we will be coming up with more sample paper discussions this is the first one for biology we will be coming up for chemistry and physics as well so stay in tune with us and you all might be wondering that you no know, exam is far exam is not that close so why to discuss these things but then it's important even before you start your preparation for boards we always need to see the pattern the types of question asked so that accordingly we can study so this will surely help you to understand what type of questions are asked and then accordingly you can study okay so do stay tuned with us we'll be coming up with more such videos keep watching and if you have not downloaded the practically app yet please do download because this entire ppt what you are seeing over here will be uploaded on the practically app 
where you can download that in the PDF format and then you can see all the questions along with the solutions. It will be useful for you to revise further if you want to revise this sample paper. So do download practically app and also download this paper. Okay, let's move ahead. Why is the insertional active inactivation method to detect recombinant DNA preferred to antibiotic resistant procedure? Okay, so again, this question is from biotechnology. It's a two mark question. So we all know the uh, process the method or the uh, phenomena of insertional activation which is used for separating the uh, recombinants from the non-recombinants and there are two methods in it right first we have one method is the, the traditional method is antibiotic resistant method where like you no know, in the plasmid if there is a region suppose if this is a ampicyclic ampicillin resistant region and if you add another gene over here then this gene won't work okay so this plasmid will no more be resistant to ampicillin so in the medium of ampicillin these uh, cells won't grow okay so we know the uh, the insertion inactivation by antibiotic resistance but there is another uh, uh, method called insertion inactivation which is used uh, also called as blue white uh, detection okay so why that is preferred over the traditional one so, uh, in the uh, insertion inactivation or the blue white screening method, we gen so blue white is one of the type, it can be anything, any other also. So, we generally use a chromogenic, chromogenic substrate, okay, which gives a blue colored colonies in presence of an insert. So, if the recom if the gene which we want to amplify or produce in the organism, if that is present, then blue colored colonies will be formed, okay. You can see and the image over here this is uh, the bacterial plate in this you can see there are some some blue colored colonies the tiny dots are basically colonies and there are also white color colonies okay so the blue color ones okay they do not have the insert in absence of insert okay so hence it is a non transformant okay the blue colored one they do not have the insert hence it is a non recombinant one means it is something which we don't want we want the one which has the insert so here uh, the insertion inactivation is of beta galact galactosidase it is an enzyme which will lead to the production of chromogenic substrate okay so if the insert is present it will make this enzyme inactive i mean it won't let it function and hence the blue color won't come up and that's why the uh, colonies which are recombinants are white so we can use them for the further procedure so this is very easy method so the, basically the question was why is insertion activation means why is this method preferred over antibiotic resistance of the like ampicillin tetracycline well the so the main problem is anti antibiotic resistant method requires duplicate plating plating and cumbersome procedure it means we'll have to plate uh, them numerous times okay so it's a and, and then separate them according to you know which are produced or not produced so basically it's a time consuming cumbersome process since it requires duplicate plating there are chances of errors there are chances where we might miss out the uh, recombinants so obviously that method works but then this method is more efficient since it is faster and you can easily differentiate between the blue and white colonies that's why this method is preferred over the traditional antibiotic resistant method okay let's move on to the next question how does eco r1 specifically act on dna molecule it, this question is also from section e basically basically this is also an or question for the previous one so let's see uh, so this question again from biotechnology and yeah so eco r1 it's one of the important restriction endonuclease it cuts the dna bases between g and a so this is the sequence which the e eco r1 recognizes and it will cut between the g and a okay this this part it will cut this leaves single stranded overhang stretches at the ends and these are called as sticky ends and this stickiness facilitates the joining the ligase okay facilitates the enzyme dna ligase so this is uh, the eco r1 this is the direction of it 5 prime to 3 prime 
and it will cut between G and A. As you can see, it is a palindrome sequence. It can be read same from the opposite side. So it will cut over here. And once it cuts here, this part will be removed. So see, you can see this is an overhang over here. And again, this part will be removed. So this is the overhang. So it will be like two surfaces of the DNA fragments. And when we'll use ligase, they will easily join together. Okay. So this uh, facilitates better joining. Sticky ends are always more easy to join. So that is what the uh, how eco R1 cuts or acts on the DNA molecule by cutting at a particular uh, place between G and A leading to the overhangs which are then uh, joined by the enzyme DNA ligase. Okay, So it is important uh, to write this word is very important that overhanging stretches single stranded overhanging stretches it will produce this entire thing carries one mark and then the sticky ends will be joined by DNA ligase. Okay, so we need to mention these two points. Okay, next question. A con, uh, this is again question 5 from section A, 2 marks. A corn farmer has a perennial problem of corn borer infestation in his crop. Being environmental conscious, he does not want to spray insecticides. Such a solution based on your knowledge of biotechnology, write the step to be carried out to achieve it. So, this is the question from application of biotechnology chapter. And so, what will be the method which you will use? Well, so these are the steps. We are directly writing, giving the solution in steps. So, we know the bacillus thuringian toxic gene, Bt toxin gene also it is called as. It needs to be extracted from the bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, bacteria which actually causes the harm to the plant and then once these genes are extracted they are incorporated into the corn okay so basically in into the uh, genome of the corn that gene is uh, been added using the recombinant dna technology and then this toxin is encoded by the cry 1 ab gene in corn okay so that toxin is already uh, produced and hence so basically if there is a corn plant so i'm just showing the corn plant like this so if the insect will try to eat if the insect or worm will try to eat this plant this plant already has the bt toxin right so it will cause the harm to the particular insect or the this corn borer okay so in this way, uh, the pest will be killed without causing harm to the environment. Okay, the environmental harm is caused when we use chemical uh, insecticide or pesticides. So using this uh, biological method, it will only harm the insect which is causing harm to the plant. It won't harm any other plant or any other soil or environment. Okay, so this is the application of biotechnology. This is how you'll answer this. So again, uh, these three steps have to be noted down in this okay so this two points will carry half mark each and this point will carry one mark okay moving on to the next question this is again the or question for fifth one recombinant data technology is of great importance in field of medicine with the help of flow chart show this technology how this technology has been used in preparing genetically engineered human insulin okay so again, a uh, question from application of biotechnology. So we know the basic structure of insulin, right? So we have, there are two short pept uh, peptides A and B. As you can see here, this is the A peptide and this is the B peptide or B chain. And both of them are connected using, I mean with the help of disulfide bonds. Okay, so these are the disulfide bonds they are joined with. And it also has this C peptide also connected, okay. But in human, when the insulin mature, matures, it has only A and B. The C is removed, okay. So that is what uh, has been done by the Eli Lilly biotech company. So they did, uh, took the plasmid from E. coli, which was having the insulin producing gene, and then they created this insulin. So basically what they did was, they so uh, we must have seen this uh, before but just for revision i'll tell this 
so when they produced okay i'll first show the flow chart then we'll come up what was the problem and how they found the solution so first first what they'll take they'll take they'll take the human cell that is human pancreatic cell they'll take the human pancreatic cell why pancreatic cell because insulin is produced in pancreas so pancreas will have the insulin producing cells and then from there they'll extract the single insulin gene which will uh, be responsible for production of insulin at the same time they'll take a bacterial cell in this case they have taken e coli bacteria and then they'll extract the plasmid from the e coli bacteria the circular plasmid they'll extract okay so now we have the gene and the plasmid i'll show this with another color so this is the gene insulin gene and then this is the plasmid so now what they'll do they'll combine these two together introduction of insulin gene into the bacterial plasmid using the restriction endonuclease basically we'll use the recombinant dna technology so now we'll have the plasmid with with the insulin producing gene incorporated into it okay so we have the plasmid with the insulin producing gene and then that is again inserted into e coli bacteria and now this e coli will produce many molecules of insulin okay so that's what we use a bioreactor since we need to produce it in, produce it in large quantities it will produce the insulin okay so this is the basic flow chart the question was only uh, what we say restricted to only this much you have to show a simple flow chart it's a you need, uh, if you if you have time during the exam you can draw a basic diagram showing the cell and then the gene and how they are introduced otherwise the basic written flow chart is also uh, sufficient for explaining for writing this answer but again let's since we have taken up this topic let's let's discuss what was the problem so this insulin which is was, which was produced by eli lilly okay this was a in complete insulin molecule which also had c peptide but matured insulin molecule does, does not have c peptide okay it has only a and b so what eli lilly did was they took the that part of gene which produces only a chain then they took so that they introduce in bacteria and they produces produced only a chain they took another part of the gene which produces b chain okay again they produced b chain so now they had the a polypeptide and they had the b polypeptide and then they combined them using disulfide bonds so in this way they were able to produce the matured insulin okay which can directly be uh, injected in human body the people who are suffering from diabetes and lack of insulin okay so this was again the application of biotechnology in the field of medicine okay so uh mentioning both of this will carry half mark each and then writing these two steps will carry half mark so in this way you can get two marks let's move on to the next question many freshwater animals so this is the last question from section a for two marks many freshwater animals cannot survive in marine environment explain why so yeah uh, again this is a question from the organisms and population so basically freshwater animals they are not able to maintain the osmotic concentration in the marine conditions why so we have so if they are transfer so this is uh, suppose this is a freshwater fish okay if this fresh so this fish is mainly found in rivers or lakes if this fish is introduced or put into marine environment so it can be sea or a ocean then what so these fish won't survive why because they do not have the mechanism to regulate the concentration of salt and ions in it okay so what will happen they are bought uh, so basically this is a freshwater fish and so the internal uh, at most uh, internal environment of the fish it is hypotonic right hypotonic okay it's not visible i think wait okay. 
so the internal uh, environment of this fish is hypotonic hypotonic means it has less concentration of salts in it whereas the outer atmosphere it is hypertonic okay since marine water as we know the sea water has a very high concentration of salts or solutes in it okay so what will happen is what will happen is so the osmosis will happen so since the outer atmosphere is concentrated and inner atmosphere is hypotonic so water will flow from inside to outside okay so eventually all the water will be drained from the cells of the fish and hence in in this condition their body will shrink due to exosmosis that is the removal of water from the fish to the outer atmosphere and since their cells will shrink they won't function properly and hence they cannot survive okay so again you need to mention two these are the two important keywords that they are not able to maintain the osmotic concentration in the marine condition and why so because their body will shrink due to exosmosis so you need we need to mention these two points okay now let's move on to the next question so now uh, yeah we are we are moving to section b where every question is 3 marks okay analyze the effects of alien species invasion on biodiversity of a given area provide two examples okay so whoever are watching i want you all to try to answer this question you can you can type the uh, keywords in the chat box and let me know quickly let's see the answer so introduction introduction of alien species now don't get confused with alien word over here this doesn't means the species which are coming from another planet but basic alien words means something which is not of that place or something or someone who do not belong to that particular place and they have come from some other place so here alien species means those species which which are not native to that particular habitat or place okay so when they are introduced it can cause decline or extinction of indigenous species indigenous species means species who are living in the same atmosphere same uh, thick place this due to the tough competition for utilization of resources okay so this was the introduction for the question and examples are as follows so introduction so one of the example is introduction of nile perch this is a particular type of fish in lake victoria led to extinction of more than 200 species of slitcher fish again this is a type of fish so because of nile perch introduction in this species 200 species of this fish fish got extincted why because of tough competition for utilization of resources so they have asked two examples you can i have mentioned here three example you can mention any two out of these second one introduction of african catfish the scientific name of which is clarias caripinus for aquaculture poses threat to indigenous catfish okay then third example threat posed to native species by invasive exotic weeds like carrot grass scientific name of which is parthenium lantana lantana and water hyacinth which is acornia so these are the types of exotic wild uh, weeds parthenium and ecornia it led led to the extinction of abingdon tortoise oh, sorry this was the uh, one example or extinction of abingdon tortoise by introduction of goat on galapagos islands so we know galapagos islands was known for this abingdon tortoise but when goats were introduced see now both tortoise and goats they feed on the a grass or the herbs both of them are herbivores so the goats have a faster grazing capacity so the so compared to that of tortoise so the goats were able to graze and eat all the you know grasses or resources and the tortoise were not able to get sufficient resources and that's why that led to death and extinction of that species okay so this explains this answer so 
any two examples one one mark each you can explain uh any two examples and this principle why this happens so in this way you can get three marks for this question moving on to next question explain so again this is or for the previous question explain any two most important levels of biological organization showing biodiversity with help of an example each again we have to take help of example to explain important levels of biological organization let's see the one of the first level of organization genetic diversity so how does it like you know help uh, for the biodiversity so gen genetic diversity uh, leads to high diverse so it high distributional range example raw wolfia vomitoria okay it grows in different different himalayan ranges and it in terms of potency and concentration of an active chemical that plant produce okay so india has more than 50000 genetically different strains of rice and 1000 different varieties of mango so genetic diversity can uh, like you no know, shows a high level of biodiversity in it then species diversity so diversity is on the level on the species level example western ghats okay that is a region uh, which uh, starts in the western coast just uh, besides that the western ghats have greater amphibian species diversity than the eastern ghats and another level of uh, diversity is ecological diversity which is at the ecosystem level example india uh, uh, has various type of uh, ecosystem like we have deserts we have rainforest mangroves coral reefs wetlands estuaries alpine meadows etc so they have these are the variety of uh, ecosystem so because there are variety of ecosystem the biodiversity is also varied compared to uh, scandinavian scandinavian country like norway which 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 does not have variety of ecosystems in it okay so yeah uh, right giving uh, the example for each of them will uh, carry you know uh, one mark each in this way you can write this answer next question give a brief account of genetic engineering so now this is a general question direct question where you have to describe it's a descriptive question what is genetic engineering and how it can be used so it's an open end answer and let's discuss some uh, important points which you can cover in this so genetic engineering is nothing but the genetic manipulation or genetic modification okay which is uh, which is carried out by introduction of genes so by other by inserting dna of interest or removal so it can be both either by inserting or by removal of dna by which you can get a new organism not exactly new organism but then with some particular properties in it then it involves transfer across so transfer of genes across species or within species then genetic in, uh, so now we need to write about the different techniques used in genetic engineering so we have you know uh, mainly mainly in genetic engineering we alter the dna deoxyribose nucleic acid so it can be either alter or repaired or enhance form or its function okay and recombinant dna technologies uh, so again this is an example were, uh, were developed in the later stages of 20th century where you know uh, we use different strains of bacteria e coli escherichia coli was widely used along with bacteriophages we know bacteriophages are the viruses which infect bacteria or by direct micro injection these are the techniques which are used to introduce that uh, uh, recombinant genes into the organism and uh, we are uh, and you also need to write about the recent uh, advancement using the various tools like we have the uh, enzymes then we have the cloning vectors and the host okay so any three important points if you write you will get three marks in it is yes hello shabana welcome 
Okay, let's move on to the next question. Define the term transgenic crop and write name of first transgenic crop in India. It's a fact-based question. B, we also have a B part. Insulin is extracted from which organism? Let's see the answer. So, transgenic crop is a crop that contains a transgene. Very simple uh, uh, definition, but we need to explain that as well. What is transgene? So, that is a foreign gene introduced and stably integrated into the host DNA. Okay, that is a transgene. So you take gene from a different organism or different species and then introduced into the DNA of that host right? or put that into certain plasmid and introduced into the uh, that organism. And name of the first transgenic crop produced in India is tobacco. The scientific name of tobacco is Nicotiana tobacum. So that was the first transgenic crop produced in India. And the second part of the question was insulin is extracted from which microorganism? So insulin is, is extracted from E. coli, that is Escherichia coli. Okay, and this is how so the genetically modified insulin was produced. Okay, so uh, define that crop, define the term crop, uh, transgenic crop will carry one mark. Write the name of the first transgenic crop in India. This will carry one mark, and then. Insulin extract from which organism? E. coli. This will carry one mark. So, in this way, you can easily get three marks. Okay. Next question. Do you think microbes can be also used as source of energy? If yes, how? Interesting question. So, this question is from uh, uh, the chapter again, uh, microbes in human welfare. And let's see the answer. So, obviously, answer is yes. Microbes can be used as a source of energy, okay, but how? So, yeah, so one of the example taken over here is of the biogas. So, biogas also known as gober gas is produced by the anaerobic decomposition of organic matter. That is decomposition of organic matter in absence of oxygen with the help of anaerobic bacteria or microbes. And again, that organic matter can be manure, municipal waste, plant material, agricultural waste, etc. You can just simply note down, mention some of the waste products used for producing of biogas. So, thus biogas is not one gas but a mixture of gases and mainly it has carbon dioxide and methane. That is a majority of it and the question was can, you, can it be used as a source of energy? So, yes. It is a source of renewable energy. Okay. So, biogas is created when organic matter is decomposed, uh, and this process is known as anaerobic digestion. And it happens, so obviously, what it does is it breaks down this organic matter, the microbes in it breaks down the different organic matter to produce carbon dioxide and methane. So, again, so this is again an elaborated answer. But we need to note down some important keywords. So, the first very important keyword was anaerobic decomposition. Okay. Two times it, we have mentioned it. You can mention it even once. And then second part was carbon dioxide and methane are the major components of biogas. And it is a source of renewable energy. These keywords should come in your answer. And then you can just elaborate in your own words and write it. The answer doesn't complete here. There are a few more things which we need to mention. Continued over here. So, cow dung uh, is the main source of production of biogas and which is obtained by anaerobic decomposition and the micro which is used over here is the, I mean, methanobacterium, which is mainly found in the rumen of cow digestive system, okay. So, we need to mention the name of the microbe as well since the question is about do you think microbes can be useful. So, we need to mention the name of the micro, okay. So, if you mention all these keywords, you will easily score three marks, okay. Let's move on to the next question. Yeah. So, our question for this. Many microbial pathogens enter gut of humans along with food. What are the preventive barriers to protect the body from such pathogens? And what type of immunity do you observe in this case? So, this is a question uh, from human health and disease. Let's see the answer. So, the following are our body's preventive barriers. The first barrier is the lysosome present in the saliva. So now, uh, since this question is asking about, you know, pathogens entering in the gut 
of humans along with food so like that we have various barrier outside the body but we'll mainly focus on the uh, microbes uh, which go and uh, inside the body through food so obviously the food the first entry point of the food is mouth and mouth has saliva and saliva has one important enzyme in it called lysozyme and we all know lysozyme it breaks the uh, walls of the microbes so if they break the wall of the microbes then it uh, the microorganisms will die there in itself and it cannot cause harm to our body or it cannot enter inside then we have mucus coating on the epithelium lining of the gut okay so we have this mucus layer it is present in our nose as well as in our buccal cavity following through the entire esophagus stomach intestine everywhere there is a mucus lining so that mucus lining also protects the inner cells of the uh, gut system and then we have special cells called parietal cells in the stomach which secrete the hydrochloric acid and we know that this HCl which is secreted is highly concentrated which can kill like most of the bacteria and viruses so in this way at every point there is a certain barrier so like for example if suppose a micro breaks the first barrier somehow it escapes lysozyme and it enters inside then we have this mucus which will not let it enter the cells it will protect us still somehow it enters and goes inside we still have the uh, parietal cells we secrete HCl which will kill those microbes so in this way these are the preventive barriers to protect a body from this pathogen and the next part of the question was what type of immunity do you observe in this case well it is innate immunity innate immunity is something which is present in us right from birth so this is the natural mechanism of our body itself so we all know there are two types of immunity innate immunity and acquired immunity acquired immunity we get as we progress as we we'll start living by the infections which we get and with the environment which we live in that that's how builds our acquired immunity but innate immunity is present right since birth these all three things are present in our body right since birth so that's why this is a part of innate immun immunity okay so this is how you'll answer this question let's move on to the next question section b 10 question three marks again name and explain the type of interaction that exists in microarray and between cattle agret and cattle okay so this is a question from organisms and population very interesting question uh, we, i have also made a special video on this on population interactions you can uh, check on our practically 11th and 12th uh, channel you'll find a video named population interactions in which i have discussed various interactions if you have seen that you'll easily be able to answer if you have not seen that after this video please do go and check it it's a very interesting interactive and colorful video now let's discuss the answer for this question the type of interaction that exists in mycorrhizae is known as mutualism so we know mutualism is a type of interaction where both the organisms get benefited and it is also represented by plus plus because both the species get benefited so uh, mycorrhizae is an basically a uh, connection between fungus uh, and an algae or cyanobacteria with carry out photosynthesis so it can be fun it is a fungus or a plant so how does it help mycorrhizae it has many fine uh, you know hyphae or structures so they increase the surface area for absorption of water they get attached they attach themselves to the plant uh, or the photosynthetic organism and photosynthesis photosynthetic organism needs water and then carbon dioxide and sunlight obviously so mycorrhizae helps in absorbing more water and nutrients so in this way it helps the higher plant and mycorrhizae also gets a shelter so in this way both the organisms get benefited hence it is mutualism and they had also asked between cattle and agret so uh, let's see ha, so that's what was given over here fungal partner helps in absorption of nutrients while photosynthetic partner synthesizes food so mycorrhizae also gets food and shelter both and the second part of the question the interaction between agret and cattle is commensalism so commensalism is a process in which one partner is benefited while other partner remains neutral i mean it's neither benefited nor harmed so hence it is represented by plus and zero like because one uh, species gets gets benefited other species remains neutral 
so cattle and aigrettes show commensalism how because you know cattles when they are uh, grazing uh, the they expose the grass i mean they expose they open up the places uh, which you know gives out insects easily the insects are hidden uh, behind the grass or the bushes when cattle graze them the insects have to come out they get exposed and the aigrettes are type of birds which eat those insects so once this insects get exposed these birds can easily uh, eat those insects if the cattles were not there the uh, birds will find it very difficult to find those insects in those grass or bushes so basically the birds are getting benefited but cattle it doesn't make a difference any difference to them so hence it is commensalism so again a reminder we have discussed all the type of population interaction in our video of population interaction so please do check it out okay let's move on to next question name the organism from which the cry gene are isolated mention with the help of suitable example why and how biotechnologists have made use of cry gene okay so cry is a special type of gene we have already discussed it in the previous question let's see it again yeah the organism from which the cry gene is isolated is bacillus thuringiensis please note down you need to write correct spelling because this is the name of organism so most of the students make mistake or uh, spelling mistakes and spelling mistake for such important words do count so please don't miss your marks just because of spelling spelling mistakes in order to remember the spellings you can note down such difficult spelling at one place and just go through it you need not even write and practice just go through it on regular basis and try to write down once or twice you will easily be able to remember the name as well as the spelling okay since the since the paper or the exam this time is subject you we need to take care of these things because in mcqs it doesn't matter spellings and presentation and all but when you're writing a subject to paper all those all these things matter especially when the paper have are been checked so please uh, note down the spellings diagrams flow charts all the these are important for this exam okay and the second part of the question was why and how biotechnologists have made use of cry genes so uh, we know that a cry gene okay it it uh, incorporates uh, produces the bt toxin and then that is produced in the plant which protects it from the insects or worms so in this way the uh, cry gene was utilized as an agricultural application of biotechnology to protect the plants from the pests and insecticides okay let's see the next question in section b it's a diagram based question so given below is a diagram representing observations made for separating dna fragments by gel electrophoresis technique observe the illustration and answer the question that follows so we have three questions based on this diagram let's read and try to answer a why are the dna fragments seen to be moving in the direction a to b b write the medium used on which the dna fragments are separate c mention how the separated dna fragments can be visualized for further technical use so it's a big question please read it and whoever are watching please try to answer since you can easily answer this in one word so please try to type the answer in the chat box and let us know and uh, even if it is incorrect no problem at least we'll discuss it whatever you know please try to answer i'll give you one minute for it okay let's discuss the answer so why are fragments seen to be moving in direction a to b so now we know that the dna fragments are negatively charged 
this is this we have already seen in molecular basis of inheritance that how dna has the 5 prime phosphate group phosphate group carries negative charge which overall gives negative imparts negative charge to the dna uh, molecule okay so it is since it is negatively charged it moves towards the anode so if you have if you remember the diagram of gel electrophoresis we have the cathode on this side cathode is negatively charged and anode is positively charged okay so since dna fragments are negatively charged they will naturally move towards yeah since they the dna molecules are negatively charged they will naturally move towards the anode uh, which is a positively charged okay so that is a positive electrode under the influence of electric field since this entire gel electrophoresis uh, apparatus is connected to electric field that is how its movement will be that answers the first question first part write the medium used on which dna fragments separate so the most commonly used medium is agarose okay and agarose we know it's a natural polymer extracted from the seaweeds so basically we take the agarose powder and dissolve it in a particular solvent or medium and which uh, forms a gel like structure on which the entire process takes place so since the gel has some pores in it which makes the easy movement of the dna molecules and third question was how separated dna fragments can be visualized so it is visualized using ethidium bromide okay also called as etbr it's a dye which stains the dna and it is the dna fragments will visible on exposure to uv light and they appear orange color bands okay so this was the most the traditional dye which was used but later it was found that it is uh, cancer causing uh, so hence nowadays etbr is not that uh, widely used we use safe dyes like the cyber green dye okay this, this is a comparatively safer dye this for an additional information but basically etbr is mentioned in ncrt so we need to write that okay yeah so now we are done with section b now we move towards section c which is the last section of the exam and the question in this carries five marks okay so we need to read the question carefully and try to answer to uh, since five marks you know makes a lot of difference it's not a difficult type of question only thing it can be based on a case study which will have most of the questions related to each other so we need to be very careful while attempting this uh, this section of the paper so this is uh, the question some restriction enzymes break a phosphodiester bond on both dna strands such that only one end of each molecule is cut and these ends have regions of single strand dna okay bam h1 this is one example of restriction endonuclease is one such restriction enzyme which binds the recognition sequence this ggatcc form 5 prime to 3 prime this is the direction and cleaves means breaks the dna just after the 5 prime guanine on each strand okay that is this what is the objective of this action that is a a part of the first question why does it cleave in this particular region only let's see the answer so that is so that two different dna molecules will have compatible ends to recombine so again we have seen this in one of the previous slide once it breaks from this end it will have two sticky ends okay so these two sticky ends will be easily able to join or ligate together they will be compatible with each other and that is why that is the aim or objective for this action to cut the dna in such a way okay so, to, uh, so that it will produce sticky ends which are compatible next part of the question is explain how the gene of interest is introduced into a vector okay so what we do is we first will use the restriction enzyme to cut the dna of the vector and that same restriction enzyme will also cut the particular gene of interest okay so and then both of them are ligated okay so they ligate the gene of interest into the dna of the vector so if i show it diagrammatically suppose this is the vector okay and 
सपोज दिस इज द एंटायर डी एन ए विच हैज अ जीन ऑफ इंटरेस्ट सर्टन जीन ऑफ इंटरेस्ट सो वी विल यूज द सेम एंजाइम सेम रेस्ट्रिक्शन एंजाइम विच विल कट द वेक्टर एट सर्टन प्लेस एंड वील यूज द सेम एंजाइम टू ऑल्सो कट द जीन ऑफ इंटरेस्ट दिस इज अ जीन ऑफ इंटरेस्ट सो देन वंस दिस पीस विल सेपरेट देन वील लाइक इट दिस पीस ओवर हियर so then finally will we will get a recombinant molecule okay that is what that is how the gene of interest is introduced into the vector okay simple next question you are give you are given dna shown below so this is the dna two strands we have 5 prime to 3 prime and then the 3 prime to 5 prime okay if this dna was cut with bam h1 how many dna fragments would you expect okay it's an interesting application based question write the sequence of these double stranded dna fragments with their respective polarity okay so now read the question carefully again they have given us a dna strand and this was cut with bam h1 now bam h1 is a restriction endonuclease it will cut the dna fragments at particular site which is that site well it is uh, already mentioned in the question as you can see here bam h1 cuts uh, the sequence i mean it recognizes this sequence gga tcc and it will cut just after the 5 prime guanine means it will cut just after this this is the direction of cutting of bam h1 now let's see the sequence i'm writing here gga tcc can you find this particular sequence anywhere in this dna try to observe it carefully yeah we got it see you can see over here g g a t c c can you find any more sequence like that anywhere no now let's see over in the second uh, fragment but then we need to see from 5 prime to 3 prime direction because this action happens in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction that is the uh, polarity okay now let's observe it from this side can you see g g a t c c anywhere yeah we got it g g a t c c so please note we need to check in this direction for this strand we need to check in this direction from 5 prime to 3 prime and that's why here also we'll check from 5 prime to 3 prime so now we found two places oh in this also we have in this also we have now how it is going to cut we know that the bam h1 cuts just after the first guanine okay that is already given over here just it cleaves the sequence just after 5 prime guanine that is over here so it will cut just after this so in this it will make a cut over here okay and in this it will make a cut over here so now the question was uh, how many dna fragments would you expect so tell me how many dna fragments would we expect from this particular this thing yes whoever are watching yes thank you mr sir how many fragments would you expect so it has cut the dna in this position so obviously we'll get two fragments okay how so we have so now there is a catch over here some students might confuse and write four they might they might think that it is cutting here it is cutting here so now we have 1 2 3 4 no this is dna they, what they have asked how many dna fragments we will have we know that a dna is a double stranded molecule so always when you are writing one fragment of dna it should have both the strands right so this is one strand this entire one is one strand and this half is the second strand hence the answer is you'll get two fragments two fragments will be formed now the second part of question is write the sequence of these double stranded fragments with their respect to polarity means we also need to mention the 5 prime to 3 prime or 3 prime to 5 prime direction okay so that is what we have the first fragment a t t t t g a g 
that's what it is it is from 5 prime to 3 prime this is the first strand of the first fragment okay and the below strand for the same one is this one t a a a a c t c c t a g yeah this so this entire thing is one fragment okay this entire part this is fragment number one and then remaining part is fragment two from five prime to three prime and this is from three prime to five prime this entire one is fragment two okay it's an easy question it might look complicated or you might think i might make mistake but if you read the question carefully you can easily answer okay so in this way you'll get okay uh, the last part of this question the a gene m a gene m was introduced into e coli cloning vector pbrc22 at bam h1 site what will be its impact on the recombinant plasmid give a possible way, way by which you could differentiate non recombinant to recombinant plasmid so again this concept is based upon the insertional inactivation so obviously what will happen is bam h1 site will affect the tetracycline antibiotic resistance okay so hence the recombinant plasmid will lose the tetracycline resistance so if you remember the diagram of the plasmid pbr322 okay in this we have the bam h1 site at the tetracycline resistant this is the tetracycline resistant and there we have the bam h1 site okay so if a gene m is introduced over here this will break that gene and hence it will lose the tetracycline resistance that's what it says it will lose the tetracycline resistance due to inactivation of the resistant gene so a type of insertional inactivation and now how will we differentiate between non recombinant from recombinant plasmid so obviously recombinants can be selected from non recombinant by plating into a medium containing tetracycline as the recombinants will not grow in the medium because the tetracycline resistant gene is cut so obviously we'll take a medium okay which is having tetracycline in it okay so if if this cells are grown in this since it do, do not have tetracycline resistance they won't grow so recombinants won't grow non recombinants will grow in this way we will differentiate between recombinants and non recombinants okay so this is the or part for the 13 question as we have seen that there are internal options so let's see this is the last question for today describe the process of secondary treatment given to municipal waste water sewage before it can be released into fresh water bodies mention another benefit provided by this process okay so now again it is a descriptive answer in which we have to describe the process of sewage treatment let's see so uh, this is the process given over here the plant primary effluent is passed into large aeration tanks where it is constantly agitated mechanically and air is pumped into it this is the first step okay remember the keywords so since air is pumped into it it is useful for aerobic microbes growth of useful aerobic microbes into flocks this word is important flocks which processes bacteria associated with fungal filaments to form mesh like structure next step so these microbes consume major part of the organic matter okay so since the organic matter is consumed it reduces the bod bod is nothing but the bio biochemical oxygen demand of water bod is high when there is very high amount of organic matter since organic matter consumes oxygen for its processes so but then these microbes will consume the organic matter so the bod will decrease so the low amount of bod shows more pure form of water okay so we are in this way we are trying to purify the water next step the sewage water is treated till bod is reduced and once the bod is reduced the effluent is then passed into settling tank where the bacterial flocks are allowed to 
sediment. So the next important step is sedimentation and this sediment is called as activated sludge. Again an important keyword activated sludge. Then a small part of activated sludge is pumped back into the aeration tank to serve as inoculum. Again an important keyword. So small part of that flock is added as inoculum so that those same bacteria can grow. It's just like you know uh, have you ever seen how they make curd? So we have milk okay then we take some amount of previous curd which was formed and then we add that little amount of curd into the milk. So that is called as inoculum okay. So eventually that milk will also again turn back to curd because that small amount of curd has those bacteria which is going to convert milk into curd. So that same concept is applicable over here okay. And then finally the major part of sludge is pumped into the large tanks called anaerobic sludge. Now the aerobic treatment is done now we are moving towards anaerobic. Here other kinds of bacteria grow anaerobically and digest the bacteria and the fungi in the sludge because now we don't need the previous bacteria and fungi they also need to be digested. This is the biological step. So the benefit since they had asked what is the benefit of this the benefit of this process is during this digestion bacteria produce a mixture of gases such as methane, hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide okay. And these gases form biogas. So, so it's like an added advantage along with the sewage treatment, along with the purification of water, we are, the biogas has also been produced, which can again be used as a renewable source of energy. So that's what it can be used as a source of energy since it is inflammable. Okay. So this was the process of secondary treatment. Primary treatment mainly uh, involves, you know, removing the impurities and the uh, stones and dust, etc. And this is a secondary treatment which is a biological treatment okay and that is the benefit of it. So if you mention these points you will easily get 5 marks okay. So any query anyone has any query over here. I hope this will help you to know the type of questions asked and to revise your concepts as well as prepare yourself for the exam okay. So this was sample paper 1. So we have done with all the questions. This was sample paper 1 for biology. As I said before, we will be coming up with more sample paper discussions for biology, biology chemistry and physics. And we, we are there to help you out to prepare for your boards as well as for NEET and JE preparation. So stay tuned with us. Do uh, subscribe to our Practical 11-12 channel and also download the Practical app. As I mentioned before, these all questions will be uploaded on uh, the Practical app where you can download it in PDF format and use it for revision. So thank you very much for watching. Good night.